All right, so I'll come on the screen now. So hello, my name is Ranger Alicia, and we have Ranger Glenn on the other side of the camera. He's gonna pop on real quick so you can see his face. <laughs> And uh, so that is Ranger Glenn. You'll notice, much like you folks, we are wearing our masks because there will be some tight areas that we're going to be within that six feet of distance. We want to make sure that we are keeping each other safe also. Uh, but here in our building, masks are still required, just like at your libraries too. So we will be keeping masks, but hopefully with the headset, you can still hear me crystal clear. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Ranger Alicia. Work here in Anchorage, Alaska at the Alaska Public Lands Information Center as a member of the National Park Service. Um, kind of awesome that I'm here to join with you because I actually grew up in New Hampshire, so just north of the border to you. Uh, so very happy to have you here and to be joining you. Uh, but now on to Alaska. Uh, because we work at the Alaska Public Lands Information Center, we have all of this public land here that we talk about not just our national parks, but on this map, this green color that you're seeing here and over here, over here, this green color are our national park units here in the state. So you'll notice there's quite a few that merge together up here in the north, uh, but these are our national parks. We have a whole bunch of them. We have the largest national park up here in the state of Alaska. Our largest one is going to be Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. And then one of our top five is also Denali National Park and Preserve. Both of these two parks you can actually drive to up here in Alaska. Uh, Alaska is kind of unique in that we have this great big giant state, but this great big giant state doesn't have a lot of roads. Might be able to see some of them. It's kind of this darker red color coming all the way up north right in here, that dark red, some roads over here. But this whole Western part of the state doesn't have any roads. So the majority of the time, people are going to be flying to these different areas. Uh, but Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve, Denali National Park and Preserve, and Kenai Fjords National Park down here in the Seward area, these three are the three that you can drive to here in the state of Alaska. Uh, but here in Alaska, yes, we work for the National Park Service, but the different colors up on this map, I'll quickly go through them. This darker green or this teal color right in here and also down here in the southeast part of the state, this teal or dark green color are national forests. So we have the Chugach National Forest close to us here in Anchorage. Down in the southeast part of the state, we have the Tongass National Forest. Another color up here on the map, this pink color right here and dotted all throughout our state and down the Aleutian Islands also. These are our wildlife refuges. So a whole bunch of wildlife refuges all throughout the state too. Uh, the last color that I will touch on on this map is going to be this purple color right here. You can see a little bit more over here and some more over here. This purple color are our state parks. So we have a whole bunch of state parks and it's been a while since I had to say the statistic 200 and how many Ranger Glenn? 226 national or state parks here in the state. So this map isn't showing you all of our state parks. They're dotted all throughout the state. Uh, but whether it is a national park, a national forest, a wildlife refuge or a state park, we have something for everybody here in the state and all of this is public land. Over 80% of our state is public land. So not just National Park Service, even though we work for the National Park Service, there's a whole bunch to explore. Uh, so we're going to kind of take you on through our exhibits a little bit, show you maybe some sites that you might see on some of these national parks and other public lands. And what we're kind of going to do as we take you through is we're going to kind of start down here in the southeast part of the state and then work our way up here to what we call south central part and then work our way up north too. Uh, but one more thing before we move away is uh, looking at this map, the main kind of modes of transportation, I touched on driving to a few of our national parks. Down here in the southeast part of our state, the main mode of transportation is going to be either cruise ship or a small plane. Uh, most of these are islands down here, so not, not too many roads down here. 
So many folks will be taking cruise ships or those small planes. Uh, here in the south central part of the state, this is where we're starting to get into our road system. Like I mentioned, the three national parks that you can drive to. Um, down on the western part of the state over here, I mentioned that we don't have any roads. So that's again where our small planes are going to come in. And then of course, up here in the north, there's just this one main highway going north south. Over here out of Nome, there is a little bit of highway, but you still have to fly there to hop onto those highways. Uh, so in this vast land, it's going to either be cruise ship, driving, or taking those small planes. Another mode of transportation that we do have that's going to be kind of hard to see on this map is our train. The train does go, starts in Seward and goes all the way up to Fairbanks. So that is another mode of transportation that you can take here in the state of Alaska. Um, so again, we're kind of going to start down here in the southeast, move up to south central, and then work our way towards the northern areas as we take you through. Uh, so we're going to mosey on over here so you can get a glimpse of what you might see in the southeast. Uh, and as you might start to tell, this picture here has some great big trees. The southeast part of the state is actually a rainforest. So they're getting lots and lots of rain. So those trees are able to grow big and tall and also very, very fat. And you'll also maybe notice some of the moss and the lichens on those trees too. Uh, but lots of rain down there. We have some coworkers that have friends down there that they are always getting rain. So prepare for rain if you're gonna head down to the Southeast. And like I said, cruise ships or small planes are the mode of transportation to get down there. Uh, so a big, a lot of fishing communities are also down there if folks are interested. And uh, there are some bear watching tours that can happen down in that area too. Um, so we're gonna also continue on moving more towards the South Central area, more towards the Seward area. Uh, we're gonna start to see quite a bit more over here. Uh, so you'll start to see some whales and then also some glaciers out of the Seward area. So again, down in Seward, Kenai Fjords National Park is down there. Lots of wildlife cruises will head out of Seward and you'll be able to see a whole bunch of glaciers. Might be able to catch some whales too. Right here we have a replica of our humpback whale. And this is a realistic size of our humpback whale. So right here, a little bit about our humpback whales too. Their tails are kind of like our fingerprints and that each of their prints is a little different, kind of like each of our fingerprints has a little bit different design on them. So this tail here is modeled after the real life delphinium. And we know that because of the way the, the design on the tail is. Kind of see that circle on the left-hand side and the dots or markings right in the middle. That is indicative of delphinium. So this here is modeled after her. Uh, but also down in Seward too, another big fishing community, all sorts of fishing charters will head out of Seward area too. Um, and at this time, I will turn it over to Ranger Glenn to talk a little bit more about some fishing and other things that you could do in Seward and kind of continue on throughout Alaska too. So hand it on over. All right, thank you, Ranger Alicia. Um, maybe if I could, if uh, for those of you out there in virtual land, if you could give kind of a thumbs up in the chat to let me know or the moderator know that you can hear me. Um, I want to be, I know I'm wearing a mask, so it's probably going to muffle a little bit. All right, it looks like we do I have can hear you. Thumbs up. And I've got a All couple, right, I got thumbs up. There you go. Nice, thank you. So uh, as Ranger Alicia said, my name is uh, Glenn, uh, Ranger Hart sometimes uh, when I'm at work here. Uh, we're gonna continue on as Ranger Alicia said, we're uh, basically here in South, South Central Alaska, the furthest, uh, there's a park below Anchorage that you can drive to called Kenai Fjords. Uh, a lot of folks that drive the Seward Highway down to Kenai Fjords there, they are gonna take those tour boat rides or they're gonna go fishing. Fishing is a very popular thing, especially uh, saltwater fishing. Uh, because in saltwater, you know, halibut, ling cod, rockfish. Uh, and then, of course, here in Alaska, we do get 
five of the seven species of salmon that are in the Pacific Basin. Uh, a lot of people like to fish for reds, kings, that type of thing. And we'll see a couple of pictures of that uh, here in a minute or two. I think it's depicted in some of the uh, some of the exhibit sites here. So we're going to move from whales and the glaciers in southeast Alaska. We're going to go ahead and walk uh, around the corner of the building here or, or this wall. Um, because I do want to point out here in Alaska, one of the things that does happen uh, there's still a fair amount of commercial fishing that does happen, especially uh, in the southern coastal regions here in Alaska. We have a lot of folks that uh, still make a living off of uh, salmon, uh, and they harvest primarily reds, kings, and pinks. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> reds, kings, and pink salmon. Uh, and they'll do them from uh, first seiners or, uh, or uh, set nets, uh, nets that you set from shore. Uh, and then, of course, one of the other recreational uh, opportunities that folks have is you can see the depiction of folks down here. A lot of people do clam digging uh, here in South Central, where we still have a population of clams uh, that folks can harvest. Uh, here on the Kenai Peninsula side, there's some restrictions. So if you do plan on, on fishing uh, or taking part in, in those, any of those recreational activities, please make note of the regulations through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, so that way, you know, you're in the right place, using the right gear, catching or harvesting the right thing. So we're gonna move through the wall here. And we're gonna get a view here of a couple of, of different items. Uh, first of all, you're gonna see a nice big picture of a nice big king salmon, the Copper River Delta. And we lost you for a sec. Go down to Whittier uh, and take the Alaska State Ferry System over to Cordova. Uh, and from there, a lot of folks will access the Tongass National Forest, or excuse me, the Chugach National Forest. Uh, they do have a recreational site uh, just a little up, upstream from the Delta. But in the Delta, yeah, uh, King Salmon. species for both and recreational and of course the commercial uh, takes advantage of those great stock returns that we do have in that watershed. Gonna go ahead and do this panel. We'll talk a little bit about larger uh, animals. So when folks come to Alaska, a lot of things that they want to do is they do want to take a or get a photograph of the, the five big megafauna as they're referred to sometimes. It's kind of a silly expression, but uh, here in Alaska, we do have a fair amount of, of moose population that call home. Uh, right here, even in Anchorage, we have kind of our own little <laughs> Anchorage moose, if you will. Uh, they do enjoy staying here year round. Uh, they give birth, they grow, and uh, uh, they're not harvested. There's no allowed, there's no hunting here within the city of Anchorage itself, but we do have these, these giants that do roam the streets. And of course, you know, moose, uh, they can get up to 14, 1,600 pounds, uh, some even a little larger. So a very big member of the deer family. And here in Alaska, uh, we actually have the largest member of the moose family itself. So alces, alces, they're referred to in the scientific world. And here in Alaska and Anchorage, we have alces, alces gigas, uh, the world's largest. So sometimes you might be walking downtown Anchorage, and lo and behold, uh, if you're out at Kincaid Park or over in Campbell Crack, you know, out of the bushes might pop uh, a mama and calf or even sometimes bullwinkle will show up. Uh, the trick to remember with them is uh, don't panic, uh, don't run. Uh, but if you are next to a building, yes, do go inside. Uh, do not confront them. Do not go near them. Uh, they do have the ability, uh, being that big, to actually do harm to humans. Uh, and we have had a couple of tragedies in the past uh, when uh, uh, folks got too close, especially to to cows with calves. They are very protective and especially in the spring and May time when they give birth, uh, cows are hiding in the bushes and uh, they're protecting their calves because one of the other animals that folks do like to see when they get here are bears. And of course we have all three types of bears here in Alaska, polar, brown, or also known as grizzly and black bears. We're gonna walk around the wall here or walk towards the back end of the building 
uh, the exhibit center here, and we're going to find a couple other large mammals that folks definitely like to take advantage of spotting if they have an opportunity to. So here, uh, we uh, Alaska has a very large population of caribou. Actually, there's probably more caribou than there are people that live here permanently. Uh, about permanent wise, there's over about 740,000 people live here. In the caribou population, it's just above that. We're just about to edge them out as far as is numbers are concerned, but they do roam across the tundra in a lot of different places. And if you do head to places, Denali or in the interior and you head towards uh, on the Dalton Highway towards Prudhoe Bay, caribou can be seen during the summer season, but most of the time in the summertime, they uh, they have cabin grounds and, and uh, that that they hide over uh, away from the highway also too for the most of it. Uh, and then most people actually get to see them when they're in full migration. I think I'm being a little upstage here by uh, the wolves. So wolves are something also too Alaska has. And if you visit such places, such as Wrangells or Denali National Park, uh, yeah, spotting wolves can occur and do does occur. So folks that drive there with their own vehicle or take the train or take one of the buses up there, uh, a lot of people will take the bus system once they reach Denali National Park into the park. And uh, there, once again, those opportunities become a little bit more uh, abundant to you to actually see those wildlife animals. We're gonna pan the camera here to your right, my left, and uh, up here on top of the little rock outcrop, we have dull sheep here in Alaska. We have the one and only white sheep of the sheep of North America, and they're called dull sheep. And uh, once again, we're pretty fortunate because right here in Anchorage, we have the backdrop of the Chugach Mountains. And these members of the sheep family uh, live right on, in the mountains. So if you take a drive down along Turnigan Arm uh, or take the train down Turnigan Arm, uh, chances are you might be lucky enough to, to see some of these, these animals because uh, they do sometimes actually come down to the road. Uh, the road produces a mineral that... Or, uh, a byproduct which they find attractive, uh, salts from the tires, uh, that type of thing. But anyhow, got to be careful of them being in the roadway or being a distraction when you're driving. So the best thing to do is uh, have your driver pull over. I mean, the train won't stop, but I believe it does slow down. But if you're driving, yeah, just there's plenty of pullouts on the highway down along the Seward to pull out and then pull out your binoculars and scan the tops of the mountains uh, for these, these sheep. Now there is another animal, we don't actually have a, a stuffed animal of it, and that's the other white mammal that we have in Alaska, and that's mountain goat. And mountain goats and sheep don't really live together with one another in the same niche or habitat, but sometimes they overlap. And uh, the easiest way to tell sheep from goats is uh, sheep, of course, have these very large horns uh, that they don't, they don't drop, they continue to grow kind of like tree rings. And uh, with goats, they have very smaller horns. And of course, all goats have something unique to them. And they have this thing under their chin called a goatee. That's the term. We're going to walk around the corner here. And I'm just going to have Ranger Alicia show you the picture in one of the exhibits of another large mammal that we have here in Alaska called the musk oxen. And here, uh, roaming freely, you would have to go to the high Arctic above the Brooks Range to see these animals in the wild. Uh, and then of course, uh, you'd have to drive the Dalton Highway or take a small aircraft to Kotzebue or Nome uh, and then find a, a way to get transported out on the tundra. And I believe there are some personal tours that do do that. Um, it would take a little bit of research to find them. But the easiest way to be honest with you is uh, south of Anchorage is a wildlife uh, conservation uh, Group, and they have a number of these uh, in in the animals that they do have down there. And then, of course, north of Anchorage, there's the musk oxen farm, and they have a number of these these great creatures of the Pleistocene era that still live here on the landscape, both north and south of Anchorage. We're going to continue on. How are we doing for time, moderator? We could get. There really is not a time schedule. I mean, oh. I haven't scheduled until until four, but you know, uh, if we okay. go over, that's not a problem. Okay. 
Well, once again, if you do have questions, if you want to type them in the chat box, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, hopefully, I just don't want to be a talking head here the entire time. Uh, it would be nice to have, you know if uh, folks do have questions. Uh, so here over to my right, probably right directly in front of you, uh, is a wolf. Uh, here in Alaska, we definitely have a, a number of population of these animals. Uh, and they're actually a very integral part of the ecosystem because they help maintain uh, healthy herds of caribou, moose, uh, and other animals uh, within the ecosystem that they live. Um, and yep, we do, uh, here in the national park system, we actually do soundscaping, uh, where I worked with uh, some researchers over at Wrangell St. Elias, and about mid-February, uh, we put listening devices out, and sure enough, even that night, uh, we captured uh, wild wolves howling and talking to each other in the pack. Uh, so here, once again, we're very fortunate in Alaska that we have so much landscape that is uh, preserved or in a conservation system to where these animals can actually roam freely in an ecosystem that's almost, if not purely, intact. Uh, we're going to move on from, the care, uh, from our wolf. Uh, we're going to move over here and look up above me. Here in South Central Alaska, um, there's a, here in Alaska, uh, brown bears or grizzly bears, they're both referred to by those two different names. However, the one thing that we do know about them is they're actually genetically the same bear. So bears that live in the interior are referred to a lot of the times as interior grizzlies. And those brown bears that live along the coastline, they're always referred to as coastal browns. However, you could have an interior grizzly walk to the coast <laughs> and become a coastal brown and vice versa. Coastal brown walk to the interior. Uh, they're Ursus arctosis uh, and they're the same animal. They do, uh, they get bigger along the coastline. <coughs> Excuse me. They do get bigger along the coastline only because of the, the diet that they have. So you can see our brown bear here above me. He's definitely uh, chowing down on a red salmon which uh, places like Katmai National Park, uh, there's a few other state parks also too that have well-known bear viewing places uh, that you would have to take a small aircraft to actually go over and see. Uh, but it's one of the most spectacular things to see because when they do gather uh, at the McNeil River Sanctuary and places like that, uh, they change their attitude a little bit and they become less aggressive to one another. And uh, it's a very popular photographing place or destination for those who'd like to see a, a brown bear or grizzly bear in the, in the wild. Um, but once again, you still have to maintain vigilance against, you know, they're unpredictable. They are a wild animal. Uh, they are not tame at, that, at any point in their life. And uh, they can and will do just about anything. But we Let do have, have these- a couple uh, questions. Okay. Um, someone asks if all the animals you're showing us are be able to be hunted with permits. Let's or see, some of them protected. Uh, let's see. All animals that we have seen so far, except for the marine life, such as the whales. Uh, and actually, even the whales, to one extent, actually can be hunted. So everything here, depending on who you are and where you're hunting it or harvesting it, could be uh, taken in as, as wildlife. Uh, let me explain the marine life. Here in Alaska, we have a unique place where the indigenous population, such as the Inupiat, Yopak, Chupak, Alutik, Klinkit, Haida, they all have special laws that allow them through the National Marine Fisheries to actually harvest marine mammals. Sea otters, seals, sea lions, walruses, and even uh, uh, some beluga, although not very many beluga anymore because the, the population we have here has actually dwindled pretty far. But they do harvest uh, bowhead whales in the far north, the western coastal areas of the north. And so that is the only exception to when it comes to the marine life. Otherwise, all marine mammals are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, and uh, only those that have, live here and have a cultural tie to the landscape and a traditional use of actually having harvested them in the past uh, through generations, can they, are they allowed to harvest them? Animals such as bears, moose, goats, sheep, uh, wolves, uh, all of those are harvested and can be harvested by, by folks, uh, either by sport or through another word I'm going to throw out here called subsistence hunting. 
and people that live in Alaska that are residents, uh, and especially those that do not live in urban areas, uh, that live in the rural settings of small villages and communities uh, out, uh, far away from places such as Anchorage, Fairbanks, Juneau, they do have federal subsistence rights and they do practice subsistence harvesting. Uh, and subsistence doesn't apply to just uh, wildlife such as caribou, moose, uh, bears, uh, but they harvest also to berries, uh, raw wood, that kind of thing. So subsistence is a whole different topic under the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. And that's a whole semester of college right there to, to talk about that. But to answer your question, yes. The answer is yes to harvesting all the animals so far, uh, but it's with a caveat or a disclosure of who you are and how you're hunting them. Uh, that's really uh, important to know. Uh, right. For folks that come to visit us recreationally, some of these can be harvested in refuges. Uh, so say somebody who wanted to come up and do a sport hunt for moose or caribou, uh, a refuge is uh, primarily the one of the only places that you're actually going to be able to actually go and do that. In a national park, no. Uh, as a as a sport uh, hunter, uh, you cannot recreational hunt as a non-resident in those. Uh, only resident Alaskans are allowed or have that privilege. Geez, that was a little long-winded there. I hope... Uh, Hope folks realize just how complex uh, the the laws are here for for hunting appropriately. Okay. Do you have another question? Yes. Uh, do you ever see wolves in Anchorage? Uh, I was born and raised here in Anchorage, and in fifty nine years, I can unfortunately say I've never seen a wolf. Uh, I've never seen a wolverine here in town. The closest I've ever seen a wolf here to Anchorage is just north of Sutton. Uh, about 40 miles away or so. I have seen wolves there. Um, they are here, though. Uh, one of the other animals that we don't really talk about a great deal is uh, we have a lot of coyotes. Uh, we have a lot of foxes. Uh, and those are usually what you do see scampering across the road uh, where wolves are a little bit more solitary and more elusive. Um, and even in that 59 years of life, I've only seen, unfortunately, three wolverines. So they're even more elusive than wolves. Um, yeah, you kind of have to get away from the hustle and bustle of vehicles and highways to uh, increase your opportunity and chances to see wolves. Uh, I know in Denali though, uh, they have a number of resident packs that are seen more often uh, any place than any place else that I know of in the state. So a trip into Denali National Park is gonna be one of your best, uh, your best opportunities to actually see a wolf in the wild. That's it for questions for now. Nice. Thank you. So we're going to move over here and uh, we got a couple of other unique animals uh, we might pan down here. We talked about salmon and fishing. For those of you that do want to come up and recreational fish for salmon, uh, probably the most popular one that we have in Alaska, are red salmon, uh, because uh, aside from kings, in the, in, the, in the timing of salmon returning to, to South Central Alaska, kings come first. Uh, in uh, mid to late May, then in June, early June, late May, early June, the red salmon follow them. And uh, those two are very popular in their, in their sport fish uh, desire to be caught uh, by folks and they're fun. Uh, they not only provide the, you know, a great little battle on rod and reel or fly line, uh, but they're also yummy, yummy, yummy to cook and eat whether you're smoking them, canning them, barbecuing them right there on the on an open pit. Yeah, it's a great little fish to have. What follows uh, red salmon uh, are pinks, are also known as humpies. And you can see the great hump that's on this male right here. So the sexual dimorphism in humpies, they uh, definitely look, each the male and female look very different from one another. The, the specimen we have here, this is a male humpy. Um, they're very, they are still edible too. Uh, me personally growing up, uh, if you caught them fresh, uh, along the beach and, and, uh, you know, uh, cook them right over the fire right there. Yeah. Totally yummy. A lot of people will can pink salmon. And those are what you primarily will see also too, in the commercial industry on the shelves at your local grocery store, canned pink salmon. 
over here on these other three exhibits that we have, uh, we have a, a salmon called the chum or the dog salmon. All salmon in Alaska actually have three names. Uh, most folks know uh, the two, there's a common name and a nickname. So here we have a fish called the chum or the dog salmon. And uh, this salmon, just because of its life uh, cycle, uh, is a lot softer than some of the other salmon. Uh, so it's not as well desired for smoking or cooking or eating. Uh, but one of the things that happens in Alaska is we do have a lot of uh, folks who still drive dog teams. And so when you have 90 dogs, and you have, they have to be fed you know, once or twice a year and kept in top shape because uh, sled dogs are actually athletes. Uh, and they have a very strict regiment. A lot of them do. And uh, they require a lot of food um, to actually uh, uh, live and stay here, especially when it comes to winter time too. So you're throwing on top of it, not just running miles and miles of practice before winter comes and actually draw, you know, pulling a sled. Uh, but then of course you have to, you know, be able to persist out in uh, sometimes usually frigid temperatures. Uh, here in Anchorage, we get down to zero maybe minus 10, maybe minus 20. Uh, but just as soon as you move into the interior, away from the Pacific Ocean and away from Cook Inlet, uh, the temperatures drop dramatically. Places like Fairbanks in the wintertime, you know, can see 20, minus 20, 30, minus 40, maybe 50 below zero. Um, and if you've ever had uh, uh, your skin exposed to that cold temperature, uh, you don't wanna do that for very long because uh, you can get frostbite or frost nip and then frost bite relatively quickly. So chum salmon do play an important role here in Alaska, but it's primarily as food uh, for a lot of those, those athlete dogs that are sled dogs. The coho salmon, once again, a very popular salmon. It arrives a little bit later on in the season. Um, it's gonna look very similar to the king salmon. The one of the only ways you can actually tell them apart from king salmon is where you caught it, when you caught it. And the gums of a silver salmon are actually going to be white uh, in, the, in the tail. There's actually going to be fewer spotting. But once again, silver salmon, a lot of folks, uh, good to eat, just baked, cooked, barbecued. A lot of people will pickle silver salmon. In my family, we pickle our silvers. Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, only because we have other salmon that we, you know, we uh, uh, process in a little bit different way for different, different purposes throughout the the winter and then summer season. And then finally, the king of all salmon, Chinook salmon or king salmon. And uh, we do have a number of these that are available. This is, uh, what, uh, Anchorage is actually quite unique in that we have actually a stream system that runs right through town that has king salmon in it that arrive in mid to late May. Uh, and people can get a license and go down there with the proper gear and uh, with the proper luck can actually land themselves at King Salmon right here in town. You don't have to take a train, plane, boat, uh, or go too far to actually be able to try your luck at, at landing. A creature that, you know, uh, in the past, to hear the legendary, you know, large kings that used to be caught, the hogs, as they refer to them, you know, 60, 70, 80. And I believe the world record here in Anchorage, or our record at least, is at 94 pounds. So if you've ever wanted to throw your luck at catching a very big fish, and then of course you have all that to eat when you're done. <laughs> it's a lot of fish. We're gonna pan over here to the wall because we got a couple of other animals too. We do, we definitely like folks to, to think about all different animals uh, when you do come here, because there is the, the large things such as bears, moose, uh, goats, uh, salmon, but we also have a number of different birds Alaska will come to do some of their life birding. Uh, here we have three different type of grouse, uh, ptarmigan they're called. Uh, and of course, ptarmigan are spelt with the letter P first. Um, and so we have willow, whitetail, and rock. Uh, and of course, uh, willow ptarmigan is our state bird. I'll take like the photograph them in the wall. Uh, they have a similar um, rural Alaska, we do harvest willow. Uh, they're very tasty. Uh, all they eat are basically willow buds, 
And so because of their diet, they do taste pretty yummy. But we also like to photograph them. But these birds, they're ground nesters, they're gavidae, they're ground walkers. Uh, and you can see them by, you, uh, you know, flocks of hundreds, if not thousands at a time, if you're fortunate. But here, once again, getting away from the road system increases your chance of, of spotting them. Now, if you only come during the summertime, you're going to see a bird that actually changes color. So in the summer, they're going to be brown uh, and they're going to camouflage next to the ground. And of course, uh, in the wintertime, they're going to be white to camouflage in the snow. Uh, so you've got to keep your eye out for movement. Sometimes is your only clue to actually spotting some of the birds that we have in Alaska. But with four over 406 resident birds that live here, um, there's a number of them you can tick off in your bird book uh, when you do come. So along with the eagles, cormorants, ravens, chickadees, magpies, uh, a lot of them are all out there and here in South Central Alaska. Uh, we do have a lot of more migratory birds that do come to Alaska. And if you do come in the spring, here in Anchorage, we are definitely one of, a through, one of the major uh, through ways uh, for the migratory birds of geese, swans, and ducks uh, that do come here. And of course, what follow them are the raptors, the high flyers. So red-tailed hawks, uh, golden eagles, uh, all those, you know, definitely come through South Central Alaska. So if you're a birder, definitely bring your binoculars and your, and your life list with you. Um, because uh, even if you come here during the winter season, during the off season or whatnot, we still have a number of birds that you can find here in just South Central Alaska. We have other, other animals uh, that are kind of in between the small little birds and large big mammals. And we do have these mammals that are kind of in between. We have three different types of fox in Alaska. Uh, this guy here, this little, or gal, uh, is an Arctic fox, which you would have to go above the Brooks Range. So you would have to go to places like Gates of the Arctic, Yukon Charlie Rivers, uh, no attack. Uh, so you'd have to basically uh, either drive to Nome or fly out to Kotzebue or someplace like that to actually see these, these uh, little furry guys as they run across the open Arctic tundra. They're scavengers. And so they actually do, they do have kind of a symbiotic life with polar bears and that they will scavenge off whatever polar bears do leave behind or let them get to. Uh, we also have cross fox and red foxes that live here in Alaska and here in Anchorage. Uh, your chances of seeing a cross fox or red fox uh, aren't too bad. Uh, but here, once again, the further you get away from the road system, the better our chances you are going to be of actually seeing, uh, you know, that type of wildlife. We are actually going to walk over through this little alleyway and we'll close the gate behind us. Um, I'm just going to open this up here and let Ranger Alicia through. Just going to close it off. Because we do have mitigation, so we do practice, you know, being six feet apart here in the center. Uh, we have some some places that are that are cordoned off. Uh, here, what you're seeing is a, a great little representation of the marine mammals we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, we do have a number of orcas that are sighted here in Alaska, especially during the summer season when folks do take uh, those tour boat rides out of Whittier, Valdez, Seward, uh, Homer. Uh, and then, of course, places in southeast Alaska, Ketchikan, Juneau, uh, Haines, and those places. And, uh, and of course, when it comes to marine mammals, a lot of folks do like to see orcas or killer whales, as they're referred to. Uh, killer whales, as opposed to bowhead whales, uh, they're a toothed animal. They actually have teeth, enamel teeth, uh, even similar to what we have. Um, and they, they do have two different diets that set them apart. Uh, orcas come in two different flavors. There's residential and then there's uh, transient. Uh, we do have a very good population of resident orcas that do call the outer coastline of Alaska home, but they are visited from time to time from the transients. The transients, one of the things that they will do is uh, they will take advantage of the large marine life that we do have that are that they can actually catch. Seal, sea lions, they love sea otters. Um, and uh, so if you do go out on a on a boat ride, a small boat ride. Uh, do not be surprised if you do see uh, wildlife in action sometimes uh, take place right in front of you. And we then, have a course, question about this animal. Sure, go uh, ahead. Why is it spotted and what's its name? So 
Uh, what do we have here? We have a ring seal. All right, and it's ring because one of the things that this animal does is it does have to evade that killer whale or orca as we, we just were talking about. And so having this pattern on their body where it's dark on top, light on the bottom, uh, if you're looking down on top of it uh, from above, it's gonna camouflage itself in with the sea floor. Or if you're looking at it from below, uh, it's gonna actually camouflage itself with any kind of light that's protruding either under the ice or from the sky. And then of course the ring pattern helps break up its body pattern. So there's no one permanent shape to this animal. And this is a seal as opposed to a sea lion. And we know this because it, it has no ear flap. It just has an orifice for an ear. Uh, and then of course it only has small appendages uh, such as hands or flippers, if you will. Uh, and then in the back, the flippers are all the way in the back. So they don't haul out on, on too many places. They will haul out on the rocks right close to the waterline. Uh, but unlike sea lions, which we have a silhouette of one here, they actually crawl out on the rocks and they use their front flippers and their hind flippers to actually walk up on shore. So marine mammals do are well adapted to their environment. Uh, and of course with marine mammals, uh, they all use a form of blubber, save one. Does anybody have an idea which marine mammal does not use blubber to insulate themselves from the frigid waters of the Pacific. Somebody wants to type their, their guess in the chat box. Give you kind of a count of five. Someone said otter. Yeah, the sea otter, absolutely correct. Um, sea otters are kind of an amazing creature. They uh, actually helped shape Alaska's history uh, in that they were refer referred to as a soft gold uh, when of course, uh, uh, European contact first started with uh, folks that live in what we now refer to as Alaska uh, in the mid 1700s, the late 1700s, uh, before Russia quote unquote sold Alaska to the United States or the territory uh, at that time. But sea otters, sea otters require just a huge diet of, of mollusks and clams and whatnot to actually help them survive in the, in the cold waters Uh, I can't get that undone. Well, maybe we'll just, if you stand right there. So one of the things that the folks do do, oh, yeah, do, do. Uh, one of the things that folks do enjoy uh, if they do come up here during the winter season uh, or even during some of the seasons where we do now have more dark than light is uh, Alaska is well known for its aurora borealis displays. Uh, we actually even have the, a forecast that is in the local newspaper. It tells you what kind of display you might see or how big the band is across the state of Alaska. I can tell you this, uh, having grown up here in Anchorage, uh, you can see the Northern Lights throughout the winter season. Uh, it's best during uh, late January, early February, in my opinion. Uh, but as we, as we know, you know, the sun actually is the one that actually creates this by, uh, uh, through its sunspots uh, as it, you know, blasts plasma out through the, through the cosmos and through the galaxy and then finally hits the last or the earth excuse me uh and of course you know being a magnetic planet with the north and south uh, it's this magnetic display that actually uh creates this igniting of of gases that turns into these greens blues reds uh, that you see that uh, end up in this ribbon form across our sky uh, if you really want a, good, a better chance of seeing these, you do want to go to the interior of Alaska. A lot of folks uh, fly into Anchorage and then take a smaller commuter to Fairbanks. Uh, and then some folks uh, actually even increase their odds even more by going closer to the Brooks Range and flying into small places such as Bettles, uh, the Kobuk or No Attack or places like that, uh, maybe even Nome, uh, to actually increase their odds of seeing the the aurora borealis or northern lights uh when i worked at gates of the arctic uh pretty much almost every night uh you were pretty much assured to be able to see uh northern lights and to give you an idea the gates of the arctic are is a national park and preserve that's basically the central portion 
of the Brooks Range, which of course is that highest range uh, uh, north in Alaska. It separates the North Slope from the, the interior. Uh, in the village that I lived in for a while, there's only four, there's only 47 of us lived there uh, in that little little town. But we we're fortunate enough to see the Northern Lights. Uh, and if I would, I, you know, I, I'll share just kind of a little little family story here with you. And that is uh, when I was growing up, one of the things that we were told never to do, if you go outside and you wander into the woods and you see the Northern Lights, you are never allowed to whistle at them. Because if you did such a thing, the Northern Lights actually being created of a bunch of football players will actually come down, take your head off, take your head back into the sky and play football with your head. Uh, so we were taught never to whistle at the Northern Lights while we're outside and alone and uh, in the wilderness by ourselves. So for those of you that followed the story or could follow the story, I can imagine hopefully you understood that all story, a lot of the stories that you hear in Alaska actually have uh, a lesson or meaning to them. And so here for our Northern Lights story, uh, it gives you the lesson of one, never go outside by yourself in the wintertime. And two, if you do wander off out into the wilderness, never make high pitched whistling noises because it will attract predators who also are will key in on you. And you could find yourself in a predicament or peril um, if you're not uh, behaving correctly. So a little bit of blends growing up cultural family. So it looks like we, uh, what we can do is we'll walk around to the map where we began. Oh, there you go. And as Ranger Alicia walks that way, what we'll do is that uh, we have just a few more minutes here before we have to go to lunch. Uh, we only get an hour for lunch and it has to be between uh, noon and one. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, definitely uh, thank everybody for listening to our stories and what we know a little bit about Alaska here. So if you have questions for either myself or Ranger or Alicia, if you would, uh, we could maybe even open it up at this time. Yeah, sure. If people want to unmute themselves, feel free. I just want to thank Alicia and Glenn for a truly amazing tour. It was just absolutely wonderful and, and very, very special. Thank you so much and enjoy your winter up there. All right. I'm going to switch places so Rachel Alicia can wave goodbye. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Uh, someone wants to know what are your favorite parks and why? Uh, uh, well, so my uh, so I started working for the National Park Service in 1988 uh, here in Southeast Alaska at Sitka National Historical Park. It's a historical park. So it had the story of Russians uh, and I worked in a little church uh, which was part of the park. That was awesome. I loved working in there. I loved working and learning about the Russians uh, and their culture, uh, and the things that were associated with uh, uh, Ivan Vianamina, or Saint Innocent, as he was referred to. So that's one. And then my other favorite uh, would be Wrangell St. Elias. Uh, I worked there 17 years, and in that national park, I got to work with a lot of youth, the Youth Conservation Corps, and uh, it's a huge place, 13.2 million acres. It's basically the size of uh, New Hampshire and Vermont put together, and then some change. Uh, so you could easily get lost, but there is a road system that does lead into the middle of the park. Uh, and so to take students out there and let them explore on their own uh, was, an, was an awesome experience for myself as a park ranger. Um, yeah. Oh, maybe Ranger Alicia would like to share her favorite national park. All right, so here in Alaska, I think I would say my favorite national park would be Kenai Fjords National Park. Um, I went on a gray whale watching tour this past spring out of Seward, and we did not see any gray whales at all. We saw the spray of one super far off in the distance, 
but we saw some, I think they were doll porpoises. We saw some sea otters. We saw uh, some mountain goats even. Uh, so it turned actually into a mountain goat tour and not a gray whale watching tour, uh, but it was just really fun. It was a beautiful blue sky day bundled up in all of our winter gear because I think it was March that I went. So it's still really cold on the water, uh, but just absolutely beautiful and got super, super close to some of the glaciers. Uh, so to have a half day out there on the water and to see so much wildlife and the glaciers was just absolutely breathtaking. So that would be, I think, my favorite park here in Alaska. Um, uh, yeah. Someone else wanted to know if the road that goes north goes right to the ocean. And have either of you guys been that far north? The road that goes north, does it go all the way to the ocean? And that would be the Dalton Highway. And I think I'm going to pass this one actually off to Glenn because I don't remember if it goes all the way to the ocean or if that's private land. The last two miles. Is okay. Owned. Yeah. So the last two miles up here is actually privately owned. So you can take a private tour to go all the way to the ocean, but the road itself doesn't go all the way to the ocean. I personally haven't done it. Ranger Glenn has done it three times, he said. All right. Uh, I think we are going to let you guys go have your lunch. Thank you so right. much. Um, you are so very and, welcome. Uh, if I get any extra questions, I can email them to you guys. So definitely. Yes. All right. Thank you All so right. much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Have a good one. Bye.